Great, thanks. So thanks for being here. We're going to talk about uh, cyber risk intelligence and using the analyst framework. I don't know if you guys have heard about that before, but um, what I generally try to do in the talks is try to separate the BS from the actual activities that we do to collect information and then turn that information into intelligence. So with that, I'll just start. A little bit about me. Um, my handle is 1Delta10T. Oh, yeah. Nobody laughs. Okay, everybody's still, still sleeping. I do security research, uh, defensive and offensive. My specialty is uh, tracking nation states, uh, propaganda, and uh, advanced attack profiles. Um, the frameworks that I use to collect and process data and information um, on different types of attacks that are out to define out who's actually behind those attacks is leveraging open source intelligence, uh, intelligence principles um, as such, and also, I'm just a connector of dots. Um, I don't know if it's overstated or understated, but um, a lot of the work that we do in forensics and intelligence and in collecting data to find out who's actually behind something is pretty boring. Um, if we use different types of algorithms or different types of ways of collecting data that's based off of propaganda, and we're trying to chase or track a nation state, a lot of conclusions that we come to will be incorrect. And what I'm trying to do, my purpose with this talk is to basically shed some light on what is the intelligence life cycle, what are some of the tools that we use. Um, you guys will probably know that because you're in an academic uh, setting. A lot of the people that I talk to, uh, most of them don't have degrees. And those that do have degrees forgot how they did their uh, research dissertations and thesis. So a lot of this is focused on things that hopefully you guys are doing too. One of the things or two things I'd like to point out is, um, if you don't know about it, the Cyber Intelligence Academy is an online training flat platform that's dedicated to training OSI and T um, and analytic based frameworks to use in whatever attack tool uh, and solution that you use using standard based uh, uh, items. So we don't uh, basically create things from from some magical place, we use standards and we try to apply those standards in everything that we do. And the reason why I started the Cyber Intelligence Academy was uh, at some point I came to the conclusion that attacks constantly change. And the reason why these attacks are changing is because when we take a look at zero days and the way that eco structure has been in the past and how it's merging now, is the lines are becoming very, very narrow and very blurred as to when we see different types of attackers, are we looking at cyber um, crime groups or are we looking at nation states? And one of the biggest issues that we deal with when we collect information to find out or to come to a conclusion, which is almost impossible, the conclusions that we come to is more often than not, cyber crime syndicates are used to sell their infrastructure to specific attackers. And the actual attacker, it's extremely difficult to find out who's actually behind that. So in order for us to find out who an attacker is, we need to basically reverse engineer the entire echo structure command and control servers that they have placed, monitor and track the information over a longer period of time, and then find out actually or come to a conclusion as best as we can based on things called attack plans and also uh, assembling these attack plans using the standards and procedures I'll talk to in a, uh, about in a minute. The second thing is if you like tools, we're on GitHub and we have our Project Divinity. Project Divinity is a really cool tool that will basically simplify looking for low-hanging fruit. So if someone has a Citrix environment or any type of environment that is using uh, basic credentials, you can plug in not rainbow tables, but your input files, and you can scan entire subnets, and it will tell you exactly which IPs are coming back with default credentials. So depending on what your research is and what your attack uh, surface is going to be like, you'll use the information, plug it into a scanner to get more details or use that and build your attack plans if that's what you're doing in an offensive security setting or a penetration testing security setting, right? So it simplifies a lot of things. It looks at HTTP and HTTPS results and can assemble that information and give you a heads up on what to look at. Um, what is the second reason why we do this? Um, the biggest issue that we're dealing with right now in trying to assess who's actually behind attacks um, that are more complex in nature and we suspect are, are uh, nation states is the fact that 
The so-called Web of Profit, uh, which is a report that was published by someone else, not by me. There is the um, by Michael McGuire in 2018. And basically in the Web of Pro uh, Profit, what uh, Michael basically says is that we're looking at a 1.5 plus trillion industry of people that sell attack infrastructure to whoever pays them for these services to basically do an attack. Now, it may not sound that interesting uh, um, at the surface, but if you're in a forensics environment or if you're trying to defend a network and you're finding out or want to find out who the actual attacker is, are you working for a company? Um, is it someone that you suspect is a competitor? How do you find out and identify who that is so that you can create your attack plans and map out what exactly happened, do your reverse engineering of the attacks, and then find out what the result is? Um, it makes it much more difficult because a lot of people that don't know a lot about security, uh, they start using SIEM solutions uh, and they see IPs uh, and scans that are hitting the perimeter networks. And the first thing they think is, oh, fantastic, it's the Russians. Guess again, it's not the Russians. I mean, it's very easy to buy servers in Russia, uh, in Korea, and in other countries. Um, not necessarily North Korea, because they're kind of buggy, their infrastructure. But there's a lot of different countries that you can buy um, temporary resources. And a lot of attackers that are more sophisticated actually do this, and it's very simple to do. So um, the common misconception about a lot of folks breaking into security defense is, Oh, I finally found the IP. I've got the header file, and now I can find out uh, where this guy is. And unfortunately, in intelligence, um, the reality is that it can sometimes take you to over a half a year to a year to actually find out who was um, uh, behind the attack, right? If there are any questions, then uh, just type up. So the other thing is when we're working on an IOC-based defensive infrastructure, um, IOCs are basically collecting information about uh, those indicators that uh, will tell us that we're compromised or not. Unfortunately, creating uh, indicators of compromise, there is a standard approach. It takes some time, but unfortunately, IOCs are very old uh, very quickly. So even though you're trying to collect the information on the data that you're assembling in your different analysis points, it's still not really going to help you as much as you think it does. And a lot of security teams uh, in SOC environments spend a lot of time and invest a lot of faith in having the IOCs. And the reality is the IOC ain't going to help you shit. Um, it'll help you maybe for a day or two. And after that, depending on the attack and the attacker sophistication, they change their indicators. Their, um, the malware is slightly changed just enough so that virus total won't tell you that it's an infection. Uh, the antivirus won't trigger off, or they use other types of diversion techniques to avoid detection, right? So the more nation-state and more sophisticated the attack is, the more uh, the alarm signs go off, and then it's an indicator that something that you're looking at may have a bigger context, right? So, And that's when the analysis platform comes into play. So some of the things is we have the evidence, we're targeting or trying to find information about a group, a person, a threat, or a risk. So some of the things that we do here are we're taking a look at the indicators of the item that we're trying to understand. What are they? Then we're trying to find out, okay, well, what are the indicators that we know? What are indicators that we don't know? And how do we get the unknowns into some type of format so that we can start tracking the information? The next piece is then simple questions like, have we seen this attack before? Are there similarities to something? Now, previously... We talked about Mirai, and there's like six or seven different iterations of, of the Mirai based code. But who's behind the attacks? Is it someone that has a specific target um, that they're trying to bring down? Is it a, another country? Is it a government institution? Is it something else? You know. And then, what kind of attack are we looking at? Is it an attack? Is the first question. Is this a diversion for something even bigger? Yeah. Is it a distraction? Is it the actual end game here? And then um, what about if the attack fits into what we call the hybrid attack mode? So um, I'll get to that in a few seconds. So when we're starting to collect and answer these questions, then what is the country or person um, uh, and the interest that they have in a specific target? Does it represent um, a specific type of campaign that we've heard about, or is it something new? Or is it a nation state? Do we know for sure, yes or no? Are they using a proxy, that means a cyber crime group that has an infrastructure that they're selling to the highest bidder? Can we identify that? Do we know, yes or no? 
Um, and then what kind of risk or threat um, do we have? Is it more of a cyber warfare scenario? Is it something that fits into espionage? Is it something that fits into corporate espionage? These are a lot of the things that we're trying to collect in the data that we have, right? So um, other th questions that we ask is, is the attack old? Is it using something remodeled? Why is this important? Now, um, have you guys heard of the attacks that happened in Ukraine in 2015 when the APT targeted uh, basically the Ukraine elections? I'm one of the guys that found it. Um, and it took us about six months to actually get the infector file so that we could piece together the entire process from beginning to end. The interesting thing was here that um, in the attack that we found, and this is all on YouTube, you can find all this stuff under um, HackDevNet uh, and the previous talks that I had. And the interesting thing was we kept on asking ourselves, okay, well, there's an infection. Um, they're targeting a, a company. Is it just the company or is it the entire sector? Is there something relevant about the time um, that this attack is happening? And then the more research and data we collected, the more we came to the conclusion that this was something that was planned. The interesting thing was about a month after the attacks happened on um, Starlight, which was the uh, media company that took care of all the reporting of the Ukraine elections. It happened a day before elections were supposed to start. So that disruption um, started to fit into a model that we had to collect into attack plans to see if, is this Russia, yes or no? Is this someone else? Yes or no? What kind of indicators do we build in an attack plan to start collecting information? What information do we need to collect, right? And these things, they start to piece together a narrative and a puzzle. It takes a bit of time. And um, we're going to talk about how we did that with the framework. So the question is, what's yeah. the objective? Excuse me? What's the objective? The objective of what? Project, if you project what their objective is, you can predict where they're going to go next. Can you? Um, the, it always depends on the type of information that you collect, uh, what kind of attack vectors they're using, etc. So, I mean, there are certain attacks that look similar to what another nation state did in the past. But again, the question is always, is this a diversion? Is this a different group hiding or posing as a specific nation state? What is the actual target and what are they, what are they really after? And more often than not, it sounds simple to do, but at the end of the day, um, sometimes you have to wait until the attack is over to actually find out if it's the same threat actor or not. And more often than not, a lot of times people erroneously say, for instance, since the IPs came from Russia or they came from Ukraine or they came from this place, it's this nation state actor. And the reality that we've seen doing the research in different attacks is we see a lot of information spilling into different um, attack groups and also into a different modes. And when you start collecting information over a longer period of time, using an elk stack or something else, and you start piecing together the information, the IOCs, and, and the actual general flow of the attack, you find out more often than not that the attack has some similarities, but there's some areas that are different. And those areas that are different, the question is, is this still the same threat actor, or is it someone entirely different? The issue that we have right now with cybercrime syndicates is that Everyone that finds an attack that's more sophisticated, the first thing they want to do is reverse engineer the attack technology, and they want to resell it or um, uh, basically implant new types of uh, zero-day attacks and other types of components into that. That actually makes it much more difficult for us to find out specifically if it's the same country, because if a cybercrime syndicate can make trillions of dollars reselling something, they will absolutely do that. The risk is low that they'll get caught. In a lot of different countries where these folks are, or in groups are, there's no um, legal um, framework in those countries to um, export them or to, um, I'm looking for the right word, to uh, basically um, arrest them and send them to specific nations that were attacked. And part of that is also the legal frameworks that we have. An interesting thing when we analyze information, and this is based off of the Munich report back in 20. 16, 2017, was um, an analysis that different groups made basically indicated that the way that uh, nation states do warfare has changed. And some of the easiest examples of how we use, for instance, um, information warfare and propaganda is Twitter and Facebook. Now, um, 
I'm not here to make a political statement. It doesn't make sense, and that's not what I'm here for. But if you take a look at the information that's going on on social media and you apply a logical filter, you use systematic thinking, system two um, thinking, and you start to assess where this information is coming from, who's posting what, who are the followers that they have? Is it a botnet or is it a, um, a social botnet or is it a real person? Is there an agenda behind this? Is it personal? Is it um, emotional? These types of things, they will indicate um, a, cam- a campaign that leverages things like social media to find an actual attacker. And this is where these things are becoming much more complex. So hybrid for- warfare just means that we're moving away from uh, the classical modes of warfare where we're using uh, weapons um, in the classical sense, like rifles, uh, bombs, and that kind of stuff. And we're leveraging more the um, IT infrastructure vulnerabilities and um, exploits that are out there um, to basically break into systems and to reuse them to do certain things depending on what the campaign is. But the question is always, how do you find out what that is? And one of the reasons why we collect this information is this. You can't see it? <laughs> hmm. Okay, unfortunately you can't see the video. That's not cool. So, just give me two seconds. Yeah, it worked this morning. Unfortunately, it doesn't work now. So, um, yeah, it would have been cool. I'll show you guys the video after I'm done with the presentation if you're still interested. I'm not going to spend too much time on that because I want to give you the rest of the information. Worked this morning, but that doesn't mean anything. Okay, so... Um, some of the things that we found in the data collection was what we call the multidimensional threats and risk theory. Um, so basically when you do more and more research about the different types of threats that are out there in the world and risks, you find out very quickly that they're related, right? Sounds like a no brainer thing, but, um, the way systems that are built today collecting information is that they don't, um, recognize this fact. Everyone's producing feeds about specific IPs, about specific areas. They're selling this for tens of thousands of dollars, and then they expect a customer that probably doesn't have a clue of how they they can use this information to protect them about um, what they can actually do with this. And in the multidimensional threats and risk theory, what we're saying is, um, and this is based off of quantum mechanics as well, and it works in our space as well, uh, that things, risks, and threats can be interrelated with each other. And when you start to collect information about previous attacks, one of the reasons why collecting information about previous attacks makes sense is you sometimes have interrelated um, uh, parameters and uh, vectors of an attack for new attacks. So that's where the prediction comes into play. It doesn't always work for new attacks depending on what technology they're using, but some of the similarities can be used as what we call um, uh, indicators or uh, categorization that you use for Bayesian algorithms to basically calculate if the probability of the attack that you're looking at is the same um, threat actor or not. Um, The way that we process this information is what we call the analyst roadmap. And this is based off of uh, literature um, for analysts. So if you work in the intelligence space, uh, this is not mine. This is basically the analyst roadmap, which is on strategic thinking. That's the book. And there's five different tasks that the teams basically do um, and specific subtasks that they create in order to process information. So in the first task, uh, stop and reflect. So is the topic clearly relevant to the mission? The mission in this case is we're trying to classify and find out if an attacker has done an attack, right? So task two, focus the message. So is the main point uh, prominent and is it clearly stated? 
So um, some of the questions that we look at over here is, um, who are the primary customers? Do we need different versions of an intelligence product? When we're talking about intelligence, we're talking about products, right? Sorry about the small text, but you guys will get the presentation, so don't worry about it. Uh, so what are the questions in task two that we have to answer? You don't have to copy this on in your phones because you're getting the presentation. So, um, and then what's the analytic line that we use to collect information to start assembling the attack uh, plans that we're going to use to find out who exactly is behind something? Then in task three, develop a, uh, the storyline. So what are the key drivers and what are the trends and the lines of these trends that have been highlighted? So um, what are the analytic judgments and assumptions that we need to make to distinguish from what the underlying intelligence is trying to tell us? And then um, do we consider what feedback uh, we're getting from specific customers that digest intelligence? So different departments that can use the information. Are we exploring additional opportunities to expand um, some of the characteristics of the data that we're collecting? And are um, did we assess the benefits and the risks of uh, basically using specific types of data. So an example of this is um, you have a log file. The log file is not protected. That means if an attacker has lateral movement within your network, some of the first things that I'm going to try to do is I'm going to plant false positives. I'm going to try to tamper with your logs. I'm going to try to see if your timestamps are correct, if NTP was configured correctly. And if I see these things and I can disrupt that, then the log files will pretty much be worthless because the information you're getting back will lead you down a completely different conclusion, right? And it always depends. We talk about SIEM. We talk about log management a lot and how this is almost like a silver bullet. But a lot of people forget that if we don't have secure operations, if the SOC, the Security Operations Center, is not doing their job correctly and they lock down the tools that we're using to prove something and to defend the network, it's not really going to help us when we depend on that, right? The other thing is, if we're working in forensics, which is typically an activity that you'll find in SOCs as well, is forensics basically says that in order for us to use this information as evidence, it has to be conclusive, it, has, it cannot be subjective. So we have to protect ourselves from the information we collect against certain biases, right? Is it my personal opinion, or is it something that we have a category about, that this category and subcategories are important, these are the things that we're collecting, it's not my view, it's the data that's saying this, right? And that's a really important uh, piece because a lot of times when you talk to different companies that sell threat intelligence, their version of threat intelligence, the first question I ask them, okay, well, what intelligence service did you work with? And most of them haven't even worked in intelligence before. And then the second question is, well, how do you collect your data? How do you turn that data into intelligence? Is it filtered? Is it non-filtered? Do you use qualitative and quantitative uh, basis for collecting the information, uh, and so on and so forth. So in task four, you're taking the information that you've uh, identified, that you start to collect and start to standardize into a format that is human readable, and then you turn that information into a report or a draft, which then says, for instance, is the writing clear and precise when you found something? Are you using a lot of terms that the reader doesn't understand, right? And a lot of us do this. We're in the technical space. When we talk about SOC or different types of um, um, added synonyms, then a lot of the times we don't think about the person that's actually reading an indication report doesn't understand that, right? And instead of flaming them saying you're stupid, then um, it's up to us to make the report understandable. Um, and this is a big issue that I have with some of the outfits out there. For instance, a FireEye report. I literally have to train people to take a 50-page report, and the only thing interesting in this 50-page report is about one paragraph. And it's nuts. I mean, you can, you know, buying a report, a 50-page report for 300,000 um, bucks, and only one paragraph is important. Then just narrow it down. Make it a two-page report. Don't make it 50 pages, you know. If people need images then uh, and additional backup information, you can give them that, but don't put it all in one report. They're not going to understand it. So one of the big pieces is, is the analysis or the conclusions that you come to free from bias? Um, advocacy. What is the value that are in the terms? What is the level of confidence that you have in the information? Is the information I'm collecting, is it something that can be tampered with or not? How do I justify and how do I know it's been tampered with or not? Right. So 
And in this space, does each section that you have in the report, the paragraph, and the sentence advance your storyline? So if you think it's Russia, all the information you're collecting, the validation of the information you're collecting, the IOCs and everything that goes in this report, how do you identify that that is actually pushing the storyline based on an assumption that you have that's not biased, as much as unbiased as possible? There's always a certain amount of bias, but you have to limit it as much as possible. And then lastly, um, present the information to the digesters of um, that intelligence. Within this whole um, life cycle of how the analysts work, um, obviously the caveat that we have is trying to make sure um, that we don't change the information through our own personal opinions and bias as well, because that would render everything useless. So don't really have that much time, but um, and this is a topic I could easily spend hours on. Um, if there's nothing else that you get from this, and again, this is uh, from the book Critical Thinking. I can give you guys a link to that on Amazon if you're interested. So we have System 1 thinking and we have System 2 thinking. Most of the intelligence products that you buy in the market that are not agency-based mostly are System 1 thinking. And the reason is, when you read through the reports, you see a lot of information about based on the opinion of that company, based on the opinion of the analyst based on the opinion of the research group. It's okay, I'm not saying it's necessarily wrong, but understand there could be a certain amount of bias. The second thing is, um, in intuitive judgment or traditional analysis, it's based on our understanding of something. So what's the context? Did we understand the context? The information that we collected, does it make sense, does it not make sense? And then lastly, it's based on experience. You know, If we've seen other attacks in the past, do we come to the wrong conclusion? Uh, for instance, in Ukraine, we had three different attacks that happened within the space of about three months. The first attack was basically um, the elections. The second attack was the electrical grid. And we saw a lot of similarities, but we stepped back and said, we're not sure if it's the same threat actor because we didn't have enough evidence to make that conclusion. We did see a lot of similarities, right? Um, and then the third attack was on the airports that basically caused a lot of disruption there as well, right? So... Maybe in reality, those three attacks were related because they caused disruption. And if you take a look at what country uses massive disruption using internet-based tools, there's a few countries that come to mind. So can you prove that? Yes or no. Right. And then the last piece with system two thinking is you have known data and you have unknown data. The important thing is to use critical thinking for the known data that you have. So start vetting the information. Make the case about the information that you collected. Convey the messages to the groups that you work in. The second thing is in quantitative analysis using empirical, uh, empirical analysis. So what are the database computer tools and visualization techniques that you're using, right? In unknown data, you try to use what's called structured analysis. So what are the di diagnostic techniques that you're using uh, to uh, evaluate the data? What are the challenges and the reframing techniques that you're using with the data that you're finding? Uh, and then it leads you to the last box, which is quasi-quantitative uh, analysis, using those computer-based tools to generate what's called expert data, right? And this evolves over time. This is not something that you build the first time you collect data. It evolves over time. Sorry, I don't want to rush you. I want to say that. Okay, so we're done? No, but just if it's possible to wrap up with that. Okay, cool. All right, so... Um, one or two more things. The ultimate goal that we have in collecting this data and using these principles is building up the attack plans. The attack plans are what we use in the teams that we're in to start assembling our analysis. Each one of these are separate reports. And when we start collecting these reports, we don't know if they're related, right? The data tells us if there's any relationships. The models that we use to do the analysis tell us if they're relationships. And then we start to piece together the puzzle. It may be that the team over here who is assembled an assumption with story A and story B, they have information about a specific attack. Is it an insider? Um, and in uh, story B, we have a separate part of the attack that basically created a whole bunch of damage. And through the analysis of these two teams, we found that story B was related to both of the data sets that were collected. Right? And this can take some time. This is not something that's done very, very quickly. So... With that, the goal that we do, the, uh, do with this is so that we can build something that's called use case-based security. 
So in use case-based security, when we assemble the information about something about an attacker and we start to get the IOCs, then we can start implementing rules like this for a SIEM for our SOC um, and also what types of information we, got, we want to collect. Make sense? Yeah. So I think I'm going to cut here because I'm out of time, but there's a lot more slides in the presentation. If you guys have questions, um, please contact me, and I think probably the last one I should do is this. So if you want to come with me down the rabbit hole, I'm on Twitter, um, and that is my email. If anyone is interested, I'll give you a card, and then I look forward to questions. Do we have time for questions? No, right? Okay. <laughs>